Jude, starting in verse 5. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example to those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Two weeks ago, we uh, started the book of Jude, and, and if you remember back, we were talking uh, about these leaders who had slithered in or crept into the church, and they were uh, abusing the great gospel of grace. They were teaching that grace is a license to sin, a license for immorality, that you could, once you had Jesus, that you could go on and live however you wanted because you were forgiven by grace. And so this morning, we're going to hear Jude's rebuke for these leaders. He's going to come back, and he's going to give them a history lesson. And so the people, the goal for Jude in this book, is that the people would disregard these leaders, even kick them out of their fellowship in the church. And so we're going to hear, what, three examples, exactly what, how were these leaders uh, going wrong, uh, specifically? And they were... In this way, and I'll kind of tip my hand, these leaders were leading the people into immorality. They were teaching them that each of us makes up our own morality, that they can disregard God's antiquated law. The way that we have to live is no longer according to God's ways, but according to our own ways. And actually, I think that you'll see this morning that Jude's message for this church in Palestine is a very timely one. It's one that will hit right at home because we live in an age, in a cultural epoch that, that speaks to this. And it says, you follow your heart. You don't have to live according to any antiquated Jewish laws or you don't have to listen to God's word. Just follow your heart. Or maybe in a more popular cultural refrain, and some of you for sure have heard this, some of you younger people maybe everyone's heard it, I don't know. But the popular thing to say these days is, you do you. I'm going to do me. You do you. I'm going to do me. In other words, it's like saying, you can't tell me what to do. You, you live by your own way. I'm going to live by mine. Nobody can tell me what to do. And this is all in a cultural attempt to live what they're saying is the new authentic humanity. The authentic humanity these days is simply doing whatever you desire or whatever your body tells you to do or whatever your heart tells you to do. I think we're going to learn this morning from this history lesson, but also that the very last thing that you should trust when it comes to morality is your own heart. There might be no other body part that is more deceitful and wicked than your heart. Do not trust your heart when it comes to morality. So it's, it's sort of obvious that we, we too, just as Jude's time, we have people who, who will try and teach or try and tell you that the Bible's ways, the Bible's version of morality is antiquated. It's something that we should look back as curious observers, but set it on a shelf. We no longer need to live under that. We could live this liberated existence. You know, it's kind of like um, they view it as, as how I used to, or I view kind of the first generation cell phone. I mean, who, who would, could forget Michael Douglas sitting in the back of that limousine making Wall Street stock exchanges with that brick of a cell phone? You know, it gives you a chuckle that that was cutting-edge technology at one time. Well, that's the way people view the law now. They think that, oh, well, look at what they did back then. My gosh, isn't that silly? Now we just know better. Now we're just so much more enlightened. We understand so much more. Well, Jude has something to say about that this morning, and his message is that learn from the past mistakes. 
learn and find out that God's ways are not antiquated, but this is still the best way for humans to live. This is still the most enlightened human existence because God gave us his pure moral teaching during that time, and only after that has it ever been corrupt. Well, let's learn from the three lessons, and so I hope you have your Bible still open. We're going to go through the scripture text this morning. Lesson number one comes to us in verse five. And so, uh, again, the first part of this uh, book is about those who have perverted the gospel of grace by teaching it's, it, it's a license for immorality. And so um, now he goes to verse 5, and he says, Jude, Jude writes, Though you already knew all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. So the first lesson that we should learn is from the Israelites who were delivered from Egypt, right? They were saved from Pharaoh and his army. They were saved through the Red Sea and brought into the wilderness. And you can read in the book of Numbers all the different ways they, they fell off the tracks. But one thing that ends up happening is they get to the, the cusp of the promised land and they send out the spies to the land and only one spy comes back with a positive report. And so... Uh, they decide to disbelieve, and so they end up wandering in the wilderness. And the text says that they were destroyed because they did not believe. What did they not believe? Literally, in the wilderness time, they did not follow God's way, or God had given him the, his code and proven to him that he is reliable. And they didn't believe, so therefore they were left in the wilderness to die, except for one who brought them into the promised land, that's Joshua. So what's, what's the lesson here? What's the lesson? What's the history lesson? Really, what's the main nugget that Jude wants them to take away? It's that you should not experience God's deliverance and then disbelieve and assert your own way. That's what the Israelites did in the wilderness. They experienced God's salvation, and then they insisted upon their own way. Therefore, they were destroyed in the wilderness. Don't do that. Lesson number one, don't be like them. Lesson number two comes to us in verse six. You hear it. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. The second lesson actually comes to us from Genesis chapter six. Um, it, this isn't specifically the fall of Lucifer and his angels, okay? You think about when did Lucifer fall so that the devil was in uh, the garden to tempt Adam and Eve. Actually, this is Genesis chapter 6, and if you know Genesis 6, this is a story uh, when the Nephilim, uh, and I'll actually just read Genesis 6, 4 for you. The Nephilim who were on earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, and they were the heroes of old men of renown. So the reason why I actually don't believe that this is um, the fall of the angels and Lucifer is because, or for two reasons. The first is that um, the fall of the angels in this text says that they will be kept in chains for judgment on the great day. Okay? The first angels that fell with Lucifer actually weren't kept in chains. Uh, that's why First Peter can say that the are your adversary the devil is walking around like a roaring lion seeking to someone to devour. Um, that's because he's, he's not in chains, okay? So these angels are different from that other set of angels that fell in the beginning. And the other way you know actually is from, um, it's actually a quote when it says, uh, bound in everlasting chains for judgment. That's actually a quote from the book of Enoch, which is super interesting, right? It's an apocryphal book. If you turn to the book of Enoch in your Bible, it's, you're not going to find it, right? It's one of those books that's apocryphal. And so Jude is quoting Enoch, who also then was referring to the Genesis 6 scenario. And so you know that, well, uh, these angels are the ones who had relations with women and then gave birth to these superhumans, whatever they were. And so what's the lesson here, though? What's the lesson that Jude wants us to know? Uh, of course, we don't have all maybe that history right in the back of our mind as a Jew would. The lesson here is about keeping God's ways or keeping God's boundaries. 
the angels didn't keep God's boundaries or what the way that he had set up the universe. They didn't keep his perfect moral order, but gave into their own lusty desires, their own deceitful desires and cravings. In other words, the angel said to God, you do you, I'm going to do me. You do what you think is right. I'm going to do what I think is right, or I'm going to do what I want to do. And so they did what they were, uh, was right in their own eyes, and they lived apart from God's ways, and therefore they are now in everlasting chains. Okay, what's the lesson to learn there? Okay, God has set certain boundaries in existence, in morality. Don't break those boundaries, or else you too might be the one who's in everlasting chains. Okay, lesson number three. If you look down at your text, it's in verse 7. It says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example for those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Okay, the third example is probably one of the more uh, commonly known examples of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And these people uh, very obviously did not live according to God's morality, but they invented their own they had their own morality, they had their own ways, and because of that, they, they were judged. What does Jude say about those people who were, had invented their own morality and lived according to their own lusts and cravings? They lived the authentic human experience, you guys. They lived according to their hearts. They did what their hearts desired. What kind of example do they serve? They are those who will suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In other words, if you want to live according to your own way, if you want to say, you do you, I'm going to do me, you can't tell me what's right and wrong, there is no such thing as sinfulness. That's antiquated. How dare you? If you want to live that way, you may just be like those in Sodom and Gomorrah who will be in judgment, everlasting judgment. So, Okay, what's the main point of all three lessons? Let me summarize these three lessons for you. The main point is God will punish those who do not honor the boundaries that God has set in place. Okay? Just because you have grace does not mean that you can live however you want. If you do not live the transformed life, there is no way that you should think that you have Jesus as your Lord. That was last or two weeks ago. And now we're learning that if you live that way, you may fall into judgment. Okay. I had a, really a lot I wanted to say now about eternal judgment and how real that is. Um, but I don't have time this morning. But you know that this text does not make any sense if eternal judgment is not real. It's serious business. This isn't messing around. Okay. Jump down to... Verse 8 now, take a look at what Jude wants to say. He's going to here boil down what these godly leaders do and to show that actually being liberated or if you want to live the authentic human existence, as they might say, then you're actually not becoming authentically human, but you're losing your humanity. That's what Jude wants to say. Verse 8, he says, In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their bodies. They reject authority and heap abuse on celestial beings. What do they do? They pollute their body. Did you know that disobedience to God's way is a pollution? <coughs> disobedience to God's way is a pollution. Because everything that God commands us to do or God asks us to do is actually good for us. It's actually good for you to do. And then when you disobey or you do things your own way, you're actually polluting yourself. You're polluting part of yourself or whatever part that God has in mind for you. The second thing that they do is they reject authority. This is so cultural, right? This is so common in our day and age, just the absolute rejection of any authority. No one can tell anyone what's right and wrong. And so same with these leaders who had gone into the church 
any claims of saying that, no, we can't live however we want, grace isn't a license to sin, they would all of a sudden reject authority, or reject everything that had come before them. And now all of a sudden, because of these dreams or on the strength of their dreams, they had this new understanding or this new way of seeing things, that they had all of a sudden the enlightened viewpoint. And so they reject authority. They say, you can't tell me what's right and wrong. What gives you the right? But we have to res respect the authority, right? We have to respect the highest authority, which is the word of God. Any authority that comes and says the word of God is not right or true, that is the authority that you should reject because the final standard is God's word. That is the ultimate authority. And then he says they heap abuse on celestial beings. And um, I'm going to be honest this morning that I don't really know what that means. Uh, I studied this week, and, and I researched on that quite a bit, and people don't exactly know how to take that. So celestial beings, most people think that's referring to angels, and, and I guess in Jewish, uh, in Jewish culture, they believe that angels were the gatekeepers to morality, and so when somebody would all of a sudden throw out God's morality or God's word, then it would be somehow heaping abuse on those who were the keepers of that morality, I'm not sure how that fizzles out, but um, yeah, I just want to be honest with you this morning. I'm not sure. And then Jude uh, starts his closing section of this part of our text, and he, he uses Michael the archangel as an example of those who use proper authority, who don't reject authority. In verse 9, if you see it, he says, Jude says, but even archangel Michael when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Look, Michael is probably the most authoritative angel. He's the archangel. He's, he's kind of like God's big bad angel, dude. Bad in a good way, like big tough. You know what I mean? And, and so even uh, Michael, the archangel, with all of his archangel authority, does not rest in his own authority like these own leaders were doing. They were leaning into their own authority. And what oftentimes people do on the daily, right? They lean into their own authority. Not even Michael, the archangel, who seems very authoritative, does this. But he uh, looks to an authority that's greater than himself, the Lord rebuke you. He leans into God's authority. And you'll often, you'll remember the story of Jesus and the Pharisees, right? In, in John 18, Jesus says to the Pharisees, I am the light of the world. Bold claim, right? The Pharisees say, on what authority do you say these things? Or in this case, they challenge him saying, how, how do you, appearing as your own witness, uh, your testimony is not valid, essentially, because they saying, you're just saying this about yourself. Nobody else is saying this uh, over you. And in verse 18, Jesus says, I am one who testifies of myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Even Jesus, the most authoritative person in the universe, ends up looking to an authority, the Father. He doesn't even stand on his own authority. Although he could stand on his own authority, right? So uh, we don't cast off authority, but we go back to God's authority. God's word is our ultimate moral authority. And so here, here's the bottom line, right? People will say and have said, and in the first century we're saying, you do you, I'm going to do me. Or we'll say, follow your heart. And they do these things because it feels right to them, right? Nobody's doing these things uh, for any other reason, just because they just want to live their own existence. They don't want to be bugged. Don't bother me with your, your morality. But the most deceptive part of the human is the human heart. Just as Jeremiah wrote, he said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart will lie to you. It will tell you all sorts of things that it wants you to hear. And in the end, it will not turn you into a, a better human or a or live a better life, it'll actually strip you of your humanity and you'll become an animal, doing only what your body craves and acting upon animalistic impulses. That's what it means. That's what it means to live out your own morality. 
Jude writes actually this very thing in verse 10. He says, These people slander what they do not understand. And the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. So essentially, they do only what seems rational to them, but they're relying not upon uh, some greater authority, but they rely upon their own authority. Whatever makes sense to me, that's what I'm doing. That's what they do. And it's a fact. Hey, when you act on your impulses, when you just do whatever your body craves or that way, you are acting like an animal. A dog eats its own vomit because it seems good to itself. It doesn't have any regard of whether or not it should do that or if that's good for it. And if it knew better, it wouldn't do that. So too, so when people act on their own authority, they are acting like animals. And God is a better way for us. God actually desires us to live a truly human existence. And only him who created and shaped us knows what that means. What are the keys to a beautiful life? What are the keys to a most full and vital and vibrant life? All those things he's outlined for us in his word. If you want to live a truly human life, you get into the Bible. And you learn what God has to say about what it means to be human. And he did this because he loves us. Because he wants us to flourish. He wants the best life for us. And the best life for us is to follow him. Follow his ways. God's word oftentimes gets a bad rap, I think. In our day and age especially. People often think of God as a grumpy old man that hates people having fun. He just wants to see all, all fun having just done away with. But that's not at all true. Actually, the opposite is true. God wants us to thrive. And to thrive, we need to know what, what thriving looks like or how we do thrive. And to do that, we have to know his word. And it's only through his word and only through his spirit that we can live a truly human life. We can live the transformed existence that he has for us to live. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and how it cuts through all the junk to get us to such truth. That your word is truth. Help us to lean into it and help us to understand what it means to live according to your ways so that we might live a truly human experience. Thank you for your salvation, which you've given to us in Jesus, and we pray that in him we can be transformed even now. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.